Okay, enough about that. Let's get into the sermon. I've got a lot to cover today, and I might not get through it all. Um, As you know, most of you know I used to be a coach, an athletic director, and a teacher, and I still can't get the teacher part out of me. And today we're going to teach, much like Mr. Schrader did. Uh, There's some things I want to cover. You might want to take notes, mark your Bible. You should know what we're covering here. Uh, If you're wondering what the title is, I'm going to cover two topics, at least attempt to. What I don't finish, I'll do another day. But uh, the title is, uh, What the Bible Says About the Origin of the Devil and His Final Judgment. In other words, the fate of Satan and the demons. So this is a topic that seems to be a hot-button issue, both these, right now. And uh, I wanted to review what the scriptures say. Um, This is also, by the way, a fundamental teaching of the church now for quite some time. Uh, The two books or booklets that would be most helpful if you want to do further research are, number one, Mystery of the Ages. Read the chapter on uh, the evil spirits, uh, you know, uh, Satan and and the demons. And also, Did God Create a Devil? So those are the two fundamental sources that you can glean information in more depth than what I'll cover here today. Most of you, uh, if you watch the news, heard about the news story that occurred in Pennsylvania, just north of where we're at here today. It happened earlier this week when a 24-year-old man drove his car into a fundraiser, killing one and injuring 17 others. And then he returned home to to murder his mother. Um, 75 people, women and children, had gathered at a fundraising event in a blocked-off parking lot at a bar, and uh, they were there because on August 5th, there was a fire in that local town there that had killed seven adults and three children. Ten people had died in this fire, and so it was a fundraising event. And the police say that Sura Reyes told them, this is the one that did it, told them that he drove past the gathering, and then he turned around and headed back to drive through the crowd of people. So he deliberately did it. He thought about it, and... uh, turn around and do it. Um, He said that uh, he was, investigators asked him how fast that he thought he was going, and he said speeding up. Uh, He said that he was extremely frustrated, and he was very tired of fighting with his mother uh, about uh, money and other things, and he just wanted to be done with it. So after he drove his car through the crowd of people, he returned home about a mile away, and he ran over his mother and beat her to death in a manner I can't even talk about today. It's so graphic and so violent. Normal people do not do things like this. You have to be influenced or, if not, possessed by a demon to do these kind of horrible, violent things. And I could tell you other stories that occurred this week, some of which many of you you have already read or heard, that are even more graphic and more violent than this. There were several in the news just this week. We see that there are many violent things happening in our country today and around the world, and we know that Satan and the demons are especially active right now at the time of the end. Satan was, as it says in John 8, 44, a murderer uh, from the beginning, and he's the epitome of evil. People in the world don't realize that there is an invisible spirit world that exists right alongside our own, and that Satan and his cohorts are injecting into the minds of unsuspecting people these hostile attitudes and thoughts. The spirit world is very real. Now, you can't, because we can't see it, people. Many people don't believe it exists. Uh, I just gave a sermon on, you know, (laughs) put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against, you know, the wiles of Satan, the devil. And and our battle is a spiritual battle. I want to take it a little further here today. Uh, James 4 and verse 8, and you might jot this down, tells us to resist the devil and he will flee from us. People who do horrible things invite Satan and the demons in, what they do is they allow the evil thoughts and the attitudes to permeate their mind and they think about those things and then eventually some of these people act upon those evil thoughts. 
and they allow Satan in. If you want Satan out, you have to resist him. God says, draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you, and you'll be fine. One of the things we do not have to fear as members of God's church or Satan and the demons, God's on our side, and with God all things are possible. We can do through all things through Christ who strengthens us, Philippians 4.13. We know that we'll be okay, right? Resist the devil, he's going to flee. And so we don't have to fear Satan and the demons, but there have been people in the church that I and other ministers have dealt with that we had to cast demons out of. And it was because they were allowing these thoughts uh, and these attitudes to come into their mind. They were watching, some, in some cases, uh, horrible graphic horror films on a regular basis. Um, they were playing with Ouija boards and other things where they were just inviting prob problems and trouble into their life. They weren't resisting the devil. They were actually making it easy for a demon to enter them. The world has become very much like it was before the flood. Let's go back to Genesis 6. Genesis 6, verses 6 and 7. Even the song leader mentioned this today, Mr. Jim Yao. It says in Genesis 6, verse 6 and 7, The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. And if we drop down to verse 11, it says, The earth also was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence, much like it is today. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Is our nation corrupt? Yes. All the way through our leadership. And, and is there anything we could just take? Is it education? Is it, uh, you know, finance? Uh, is there any field that we just take right into the kingdom and go, this is it. This is how God does it. No, it's all got to be like erased, wiped clean. We got to start over because we're not doing what God said. God's far from us. And it's been decades since we put them out of the courthouse and we took the Ten Commandments down. We stopped prayer in schools. We've been heading the wrong direction for a long time, and it's catching up with America. It's hard to pray. I can't say God bless America right now. God's not going to bless this kind of behavior and this kind of action. And, and it says here, verse 13, God said to Noah, the end of flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. We're at that point now, much like it was before the flood. And when we go to Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Prophecy, let's go over there. Matthew 24, notice what God says. Today we're going to talk a little bit about history, and we're also going to talk a lot about prophecy. Uh, Mr. Fritz mentioned in his sermon on the first uh, four seals, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the duality and prophecy. You can see some of that in the sermon here today. But in Matthew 24, beginning in verse 37, uh, it says, it's prophesied, but as in the days, sorry, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. That's at the time of the end, it's the earth and the, and the people, the inhabitants of the earth are going to be much like they were in the days of Noah. It, violence is going to fill the earth. And if you look at the number of wars being fought right now, just, you know, look, Google it, check it out. And the violence that occurs, not just in our country, but around the world, not just in our inner cities, right? But look at countries and cities around the world, and uh, you'll see how the earth has become violent. And uh, it says, but as, in the, as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of Son of Man of be. For as, for as the days before the flood, notice they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also with the coming of son, uh, the Son of Man be. So God said, look, it's going to come like a thief in the night. It's going to catch the world by surprise. Um, they're going to be going on with their normal activities, right? And just going about their lives, and this is going to catch them unexpectedly. It ought not catch us by surprise. And there are a lot of verses that tell us that. We are watching. We're paying attention, right? We stay close to God, and we see what's happening, and we read the prophecies of the Bible, and we go, look, we're there. 
these things we've talked about for, you know, I've been in the church over 50 years. We've been talking about this the whole time or happening. The prophecies are being fulfilled. We're at the end of the age and too many people are just fast asleep. Remember the dominant era, right? Is Laodicea at the time of the end. It's still God's church. It's one of the years of God's church. But when you read the description of Laodicea, right? The people decide is what the word means. <laughs> We see it all around us, and if we're not careful, we, anybody sitting here today, becomes Laodicean or is Laodicean. We're not immune. Uh, there are people who are on fire uh, here or there. They're scattered. But we have to realize, look, the earth has become like it was before the flood. We see these news stories. That they just come in day after day, week after week. It's amazing how many horrible things that, that are out there, and after a while, you don't want to even look because it makes you literally sick to your stomach and it's so violent and so graphic even the news stories you know like i don't think you know the children should hear this right now i might have a nightmare just hearing what this guy did or this person did and again it's going to catch the world by surprise you and i are in a spiritual battle and it's important that we know our enemy and that we are prepared for for the battle and I want us to go to Genesis 1 1. <laughs> and thank you, Mr. Schrader. I can skip some of my notes here. That'll help. As he mentioned uh, already in the beginning, and he explained that uh, quite well, uh, in the beginning of the physical universe, uh, God created the heavens by that, by the way, the Hebrew word is plural. I think in the King James it says heaven. Most translations, many translations say heavens, but the Hebrew word that Moses used is plural. It includes not only the earth, but the entire universe. Mr. Armstrong explained that in Mystery of the Ages. Um, in Genesis 2, 4 helps to support that. I'm going to drop down, created by the way, bara, B-A-R-A, -A, uh, implies a perfect work. When God does things, he does them very good. They're perfectly done. What God creates, that's, that's the way he does it. You know, some of us uh, say we do our job. Some, of, some people do their job poorly. Some do it pretty good. Others do an excellent job. Some are, some are like craftsmen. You know, they're masters at what they do, and, and God is beyond that. I mean, he does things perfectly, and what he creates is perfect. And it says in verse 2, the earth was, it says in most, well, many translations, uh, the word was, by the way, in Hebrew is H-A-Y-A-H, H-A-Y-A-H, and it means became, and it's translated that way. I'll just give you three quick verses here in Genesis, Genesis 19, 26, Genesis 2, 7, and Genesis 9, 15, and there are many more in the first three chapters of the Bible where the word H-A-Y-A-H is used, and it denotes a condition that was different from a former condition. It became that way. It wasn't always that way. In other words, when we read further in verse 2, it says, the earth became without form and void. The words that are used there are, again, in the Greek, tohu and bohu, T-O-H-U and B-O-H-U, and they, those words translated into English mean uh, a, a state that is chaotic, uh, in confusion, waste, and empty. Uh, the Rotherham translation says, now the earth had become waste and empty, and other translations uh, correctly rendered it that way. Um, Everything, again, that God creates is perfect. God, God is not the author of confusion. We, we've used that verse in the church for a long time, right? 1 Corinthians 14, God's not the author of confusion. And one of the things I think the church has done quite well is organize things down through time. Feast sites, uh, you know, congregations or whatever, they're, they're organizers. Like They're structured. Uh, the Israelites, when they left Egypt, went out in orderly ranks with hardly any notice. But, man, they got grouped into groups and or organized uh, that, that we sometimes do quite well. Uh, we don't always do everything else so well, but that, that we do quite well in most cases. Uh, not in all cases today, but, but anyway. Now, 
you have to ask yourself a question anyway. Why would God create something in disorder and then have to straighten it out? That wouldn't make any sense. God just not the way God is. Like he doesn't do something kind of halfways. Um, you know, my dad was one of those perfectionists. And he was a mechanic. He worked on race cars, and he wanted them tuned perfectly. He wanted to get maximum horsepower out of the motor. Uh, he had to make sure the camshaft and everything was coordinated with the heads and the valves, and everything had to fit. It had to be it had to be perfect, or we're not going to get the horsepower we need. And this car isn't going to run as fast down the track as it could. And uh, he had a house full of trophies. He raced a lot in the early '60s, into the mid '60s. And uh, broke two world records back then. Uh, you know, he was a big-time racer. He beat some big-name racers back in the day. Um, but when I worked in his shop, my brother and I worked uh, after school. We, we would do, you know, we, we would do our sports, and then we'd go home and eat, and then we'd have to go work at the shop. And it was pretty much our life, you know, Monday through Thursday. And at 11 o'clock, Dad says, 11 o'clock, shut the lights off, and we go home and get a snack and go to bed and then get back up and go to school. We got Fridays off, which was awesome because Sabbath was coming. So we never had to work at the shop on a Friday night, but he had his own shop, his own business. But when we worked for him, we couldn't do something halfways. Now I did some things that I didn't know what I was doing that I you know, screwed it up. I remember breaking a head on a customer's car because I was turning the bolt the wrong way and I just got a longer pipe and I broke it. And I, dad was not happy, it cost us some money because it wasn't the customer's fault, it was ours. But he wanted things done right. If you don't know how to do it, ask. So I learned when I was young, you gotta ask if you don't know, because this ain't gonna go well otherwise. But it, it, the amount of perfection that my dad had with cars and tuning carburetors and stuff like that, does, it's not even the ballpark, uh, the perfection that, that God has. I mean, it's just, we can't even wrap our mind around how perfectly he does things. Now, when we get from verse 2 on, the remaining of the first chapter of the Bible is not describing the original creation of the earth. And David bears that out in the Psalms. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, and we have to wonder what caused this tohu and bohu, what caused the earth to get into a state of confusion and to be waste and empty? And why did this occur? How did this occur? And that's when we get back to the origins of things here. Now, after verse 2, from there on, it's describing the renewing of the face of the earth. Once again, read the mystery of the ages. It really is. And uh, did God create a devil? So after that, it, it became waste and empty. And we see it happen because of the sin of angels. And so what did happen from verse 2 on happened approximately 6,000 years ago. We're coming to the end of that 6,000 years allotted to Satan, God gave him the, 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 the uh, duty of being over the earth. And that's coming to an end, and we're going to have the 1,000 years, the millennium, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ to follow a 7,000-year plan of salvation. It fits perfectly with a week, right? Seven days in the week. And the seventh day was a Sabbath, and it's going to be like a Sabbath in that respect, Right? Uh, rest is used, that word rest is used in the New Testament several times associated with the millennium, the millennial rest. And uh, it's going to be awesome. And we're going to contrast 6,000 years of Satan and the stories we hear like the one in Pennsylvania and others. And then 1,000 years under Christ and we go, man, there's no way human beings should look at this and say, there's no way I want to go back to that. And we have lived here, done this, been there, done it, and <laughs> we don't want it. Like, God, let us be born into your family. Uh, let us become a part of that. Now, the book of Job shows God talking with Job in several cases. And I want to go to Job 38. We know that Job was a righteous man and that Job accomplished many things in his life. Um, the implication here is that Job, as you read the story, had directed the building of some great edifice, uh, such as the Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. And as we read here, we get next to the end of the book of Job, we see that God is humbling Job. He, he, God needs us to be humble if we're going to be in his kingdom and if we're going to rule with him. He can't use us otherwise. And Christ really spotlighted that with a foot washing ceremony that he instituted at the end, you know, the final Passover there at the end of his life. He says, look, you know, Humility is key here, 
and, and Christ himself did not come to be served, right, but to serve. Uh, I have people hit me up on church government all the time. I mean, everybody's hammering me from every direction. The implication is you put yourself in a spot where you're in charge and you set yourself up in, a, in this key position like the Pope. And I go, you guys don't get it. That's not what Mr. Armstrong talked about when he said top-down government. Is there government? In, in Corinthians, Paul says, 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 3, he says, look, the head of man, I mean, the head of the woman is man. He said, I set it up that way. The man's the head of the household. That, that's his role. The head of man, though, is Christ. The head of the woman is man. And then he said the head of Christ is God. There's even top-down government in the family of God. God the Father is at the top. Christ, however, is the head of the church. In the Catholic Church, the Pope is the vicar of Christ. He sits in the seat of Christ as Christ. The Catholic Church even uses terms, right, for popes, Holy Father. That's a term for God the Father. That's blasphemous. And yet that's the term they use. That's the position the Pope sits in. We know I'm not head of this church. I'm not your boss. Christ is the head of this church, and you're his people. My job is to do what Christ did, and that serve the people. I also do have to make decisions at the end of the day. Somebody has, the buck has to stop somewhere, and a decision has to be made, but that's after counsel, advice. If it's a big thing, prayer and fasting, and we make a decision, and if, as a human, I make a mistake. Did, did humans make mistakes in the Bible? Did Mr. Armstrong ever make a mistake? Yep. Correct it. That's what David did. That's what Mr. Armstrong did. That's what I would have to do. But we have to make decisions. We're not going to vote on everything and not get anything done. It, it, it's got to be the way God set it up, and it's the same in a family, same in God's family, the same way in a church. And so we, we, again, have to understand, though, that leadership, any minister that's here, we're here to serve. We're here to help. We're going to try and get as many, drag them along with you. Get on my back. we got to get to the kingdom. Let's work. we got to get people there, turn people to Christ. God calls them. They're his people. We do what we can to encourage, motivate, and strengthen anybody we can along the way. And you all play a role in that. Some of you have good friends that you're helping. Some of you have family that you're helping. You, you, you have your own family that you're trying to get to the kingdom. My most important job in my family and my wife's most important job is to see their kids get into the kingdom as much as we can control that. At the end of the day, they have to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling but it's my job to train up a child in the way he should go, and my wife's job, so that when they're old, they don't depart from it. And even if they're the prodigal son or daughter, I hope they return and get back right, because they, they had a spark there. They didn't let it go. But see, when we look at the way that God set things up here, God is at the top. Satan wasn't okay with that. Well, Lucifer, who became Satan. He wanted to knock God off the throne. He wanted to be in charge. And that we see where the problem lay here in a minute. But let's go to Job 38 and notice what God said to Job about the creation. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Verse 5, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Now, morning stars, uh, I meant, uh, let's just, I, I don't have this here in my note, but notes, but let's go to uh, Revelation, keep your point here. Revelation uh, chapter 1. Uh, the Bible uses symbols, and the symbol star is often used for angel. And here's uh, an example, Revelation chapter 1, in about verse 20. It says, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So you see here's an example. And, and we could turn to many more, but in the Bible, that when you see certain key words, they can be used and are used as symbols. And in this case, the morning stars refer to the angels that God created. Um, God also mentions that they are the sons uh, of God. And they're referred to that because they were created beings, um, not because they're begotten. 
and uh, going to be born into God's family as members of it. God didn't promise that to the angels. But, but that's why the phrase is used. Uh, it's also interesting, I might point out here in, in this, these few verses in Job, um, that the Great Pyramid has a stone that is laid, the, the cornerstone is laid at its pinnacle, not, a, not in the foundation. So sometimes when you, in the Bible, read about a cornerstone, it's the keystone and the foundation. Other times, it's like the capstone of the pyramid. And in, in this case, that's the term and that's how it's used, at the pinnacle. So the morning stars are also light bringers. Um, in other words, light equals truth. So the angels that God created and the archangels, the morning stars were light bringers. And so the Bible, again, interprets its own symbols uh, and they are created beings. Uh, they didn't always exist. John 1.1 1, 1 and John uh, 1, 2, and 3 explain the only two eternal, ever-living, always existing beings or personages are the Word and God. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us in John 1 there. So it, it, that shows us, look, even in Genesis, uh, it says, let us make man in our image. It's, there's more than one, as uh, Brandon pointed out. Uh, go to Isaiah 45, 18 now. We mentioned that when God does things, he does them perfectly. When he created things, they were done. It was very good. And when we get to Isaiah 45, 18, here's another key verse that shows us this. It says in verse 18, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, uh, Who is God who formed the earth and made it, who established it, who did not create it in vain? And the word there is T-O-H-U, tohu. The same word, exact same word, with the exact same meaning that we see in Genesis verse 1 and verse 2. God did not create it in vain. He did not create it waste, empty, in a state of confusion. Here's a key verse that shows us that. The Bible interprets itself. It became that way, and it became that way because the angels sinned, and I'm going to take a little time in Isaiah and Ezekiel to go through that here in a minute. Um, 2 Peter 2, 4 first, though. This shows that it was the sin of the angels that caused the destruction to the earth. This, this passage in 2 Peter 2 and verse 4 is a key to explaining this. You know, sometimes people uh, will say, church is wrong on this, church is wrong on that. And uh, often I'm like, can, can I weigh in on this? Do you want to hear what, what we teach and why we teach it? And let me show you the verses before you decide that we're, we're off on this or we're off on that. Can, can we at least do that so that you can see the biblical proof for why we teach what we teach? And, and so, you know, in, in a case like this, you should be able to explain what I'm explaining here today about the origin uh, how did devil come into existence or Satan come into existence? Uh, 2 Peter 2, 4, it says, For God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell. The word there is T-A-R-T-A-R-O-O, -O, Tartaru, T-A-R-T-A-R-O-O. -O. And this is, this is a word not found in any other verse in the Bible. It's only used here. And it comes from the word Tartaros, with an S, meaning place or condition of restraint. So when it says, I cast them down to hell, Tartaru, right? A condition or place of restraint. And delivered them into chains, notice again, restrained, chains of darkness, the opposite of light and truth, right? Darkness. To be reserved for judgment. And when we read Paul's writing in Corinthians, we say someday we're going to be judging angels. And they're reserved to judgment. Okay, now the next verse, verse 5 says this. And by the way, the penalty here for the sin of the angels is not death as it is for man. And we're going to show you several verses that point that out. Angels are immortal spirit beings. They cannot die. And Christ said so to the Sadducees. We'll look at the verse in a bit. So the universal worldwide sin of the angels resulted in the physical destruction of the face of the earth and destruction we see throughout the universe. This angelic sin caused Lucifer to become Satan, the devil, and those angels that went along with him in the rebellion to become demons. 
Those are the forces of evil that we wrestle against today. And they are powerful spirit beings. And as a human, you have no chance against a demon or Satan. We see a man in the New Testament possessed by a legion of angels, and he broke chains and, and uh, the, the metal clamps that they put around his own wrist and feet, uh, they couldn't restrain the guy. You'd think, well, you break your bone before you get le loose of that, but when you're possessed by a demon or demons in his case, the rules go out the window. So we're dealing, this is what we're dealing with, and we have to make sure we understand that and also, no, don't fear it. If you're close to God, God says, they can't, a demon can't do anything to you, and neither can Satan. Job, who was a righteous man, God said, okay, Satan, you can go ahead. I'll let you take everything away that he has, but you can't touch Job. And, and he did, and, and Satan was wrong. Job didn't curse God. Even his wife says, curse God and die, but no, Job wouldn't do it. He said, well, all that a man has, you know, if you let me touch his health, his, him, his personal self, then he'll curse you. And Job didn't curse God then either. The end of chapter one, he said, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of God, right? Like, wow, what a guy, righteous guy. But God said, no, you still got some things. Yeah, I got to humble you. You're not ready. And he humbled Job and he, big time as you read the story, the 42 chapters. Um, God's not done with us. That's why we're alive and we, we're still going and we got things to learn. And hopefully we're teachable and we're growing and, and all that. But again, I, I want to point out that it was sin that caused the destruction. Lucifer became Satan, the devil, the angels, the fallen angels, the sinning angels became demons. Verse 5 says, they did not, uh, And did not spare the ancient world, that's from Adam to Noah, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. And it's interesting that God only refers to Noah as being righteous, not the others. But they were family, and God took him and his family and protected them. When we flee, people go, oh, what about my family? I, I look at that example. I look at the example of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot's sons-in-laws had a chance to flee along with him, but they mocked him and said, man, you lost your mind. It's, we're not leaving. And those cities were burnt to the ground, but they had an opportunity. Uh, maybe, maybe some of your relatives and friends will have an opportunity like Noah's and like Lot's. But at the end of the day, most of them, only eight people got on a boat. Only Lot, his wife, and two daughters actually left, and they got to, had to be dragged out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, here's a destruction that took place. Only eight people survived it. God flooded the whole earth because of sin. This chaotic condition, that, that this flood that occurred was a result of sin. Now, the sin of the angels is mentioned first because it occurred first, and then this sin is mentioned about man because it occurred again. And then in verse 6, it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, these two Canaanite cities. And it says, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them, notice, an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. We have the flood as an example for us. We have Sodom and Gomorrah as an example. God says, you want to live ungodly? This word ends up. We have the angels as an example. This word ends up. Death, misery, <laughs> there's no happiness. Those of you who have been in the world know, look, I want out of that. This, the world is not a happy place and living the way the world is miserable obeying God and living by his word brings peace brings happiness joy even in the midst of this violence and this horrible world we live in God's people should have joy now of course we cry and sigh about the abominations committed and we see it all around us but you know what it shouldn't drag us down into depression and suicide and everything else we we have hope of the resurrection we have hope of christ returning we know about the plan of god we realize that this life is temporary somebody this week asked me why do we have a temporary dwelling at the feast and you know i said because god tells us to you know, why do you put the physical leaven out of your home during the days of unleavened bread right it's just physical bread leaven 
you do it to learn a spiritual lesson. When you, even kids, you put an 11 out, you go, look, this picture's sin. I got to get sin out of my life. I can, I can wrap my mind around that, right? And out goes the physical 11. But what is God really wanting us to get? Put the sin out of your life. Change. Overcome. Why do you get a temporary dwelling at a feast? Why do you do the physical act of getting a temporary dwelling? And when I was a kid in Regina, Saskatchewan, the capital, we had a feast site. And we had people come in from other provinces, and I remember staying in our home. We moved out of our home, and we got a temporary residence. They moved into our home, which was temporary for them, because they came from two provinces over, and they didn't have enough feast tithe. They were living on a fixed income. And so they had something temporary. But God wants us to realize this life is temporary, that we are pilgrims and strangers. We're just passing through. We're developing character so someday we can be born into God's family and we're going to go through some hard things, some difficult trials and tests to strengthen our character so God knows, now I know, like he did with Abraham, now I know. Welcome to my family. That's where we're at. So when hard times come, difficult things happen, keep perspective. Even death, God says, well, you got the hope of the resurrection. Death is hard. It's tough for Thea and the three kids right now. By the way, we have their tithe, right, to help, at least with with that. And that's what it's designed for. That's where it's kept separate from other money. This is third tithe assistance, and we can help. There are certainly government programs that will assist in that. But we'll make sure they got food and lodging, and they need help. We got it. You're you're now a widow. Your kids just have mom, no dad. We'll, we'll deal with it. it. A lot of you, even in this room, have lost loved ones, and so have we. But I know I'm going to see them soon. I know the resurrection is real. I know Christ is coming back, and therefore I can cope with that. I can, I can move forward. I have hope. You should have hope. Okay, that wasn't in here. Let's get back to where we were. Okay. Uh, Again, the example that we learn from, right? We see what happens as a result of sin. Uh, Jude 6, uh, and Jude is right before Revelation, just a real short book. There's only one chapter, so that's why I'm saying Jude 6, verse 6. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, again, restrained from light and truth, for the judgment of the great day. And in Hebrews, Paul tells us, for he did not put the world to come, of which we speak, and he's talking about the kingdom, in subjection to angels. Who's going to be running cities? You know, maybe ten cities or five cities. Who's going to be over the Israelite nations? David. Each of the apostles over each of those Israelite nations. It's going to be spirit beings who are members of God's family, that he's going to put the world to come in subjection to, not angels. That's going to be our job. Satan knows that the day is coming when we will judge angels, that we will be in a power and authority above him, and he can't stand it. And he's going to do everything he can to discourage you, to get you to drop out of this race, to get you to quit, to get you down and out. And some of you on the stream, you are very scattered. And you go, man, it's just me or there's just three of us and I'm out here in the middle of nowhere. Don't quit. Christ is coming. It's not far away. And if you don't endure, God says he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. If you don't hang in there, you don't endure. You don't put forth the effort to, for instance, get to the feast. I've heard of people, oh, I can't get to the feast. Uh, yeah, you can. What do you mean you can't get to the feast? We'll help you financially if that's a problem. Well, I can't take that much time off work, so I guess your job's before God then. That's, that's backwards. Can God not keep your job for you if you take an extra day or two to get to the feast and back? Yeah, he can. What are you doing? What do you mean you're not going to the feast? God commands you to be there. This can't be. I don't understand it. We're too close to the end, and some of you have been here a long time. Don't stop now. I always tell old people, hey, you're, you're in the final stretch, man. You're in the, the finish line's right there. Your life's going to end because you're getting really old, or Christ is going to come back pretty soon, and you're going to make it to that point. 
But you're, either way, for you, that finish line is really close. And some of you in the back, you know who you are, right? <laughs> Mrs. Shelton, Mrs. Crawford, Janet Frank, uh, Gene, and others, okay? And Mr. Pitt. No, I'm just kidding. He's... <laughs> I shouldn't really call you up by name. Now everybody knows anyway. But the point is, the point is, let's finish strong, right? I, ha I had a friend, uh, Joette and I, uh, pastored Dubuque, Iowa. And I say I because she's, you know, we, we've said it, half the ministry, she does a lot to serve the church and works, uh, I don't even know how many hours a week in addition to her regular job. But... Um, uh, a guy named Steve Michael, like I'm, I'll use his name because it's a good example. He was a member of Dubuque, Iowa. He was in his 80s uh, at the time. And he called me right before the feast and said, I can't go, man. He said, my house bad. And he lost control of his bodily functions and stuff at this point. And, I, I, and he said, I canceled my hotel and I'm not going to go. And I just thought you ought to know. And I, I said, well, I'm really glad you called. And how many feasts have you missed? In, in the decades you've been in the church? And he said, well, I haven't missed any. And I said, well, why start now? Well, you know, I just told you why. I said, well, those, those are excuses. I mean, you're just looking for excuses. I mean, those aren't good reasons. To, to do something God tells you to do, you're not going to do it because of these things? Like, you got to let that go. I know somebody in your church area that's happy to give you a ride. They understand you're old, and they may have to make some stops, and, and there's things you can do. And he called me back the next day. He said, got my reservation back. I'm going to the feast. And he went to the feast in Wisconsin Dells, and he enjoyed it. He went out to dinner with people. He had the senior luncheon. And that afternoon after, he just had a ball, and he went back, and he laid down in his bed, and he died. And that evening, the people that drove him to the feast went to pick him up for dinner, and he didn't answer the door. They get the hotel manager. Sure enough, he's laying there, sleep, fast sleep. He didn't struggle. Didn't do, he just went to sleep at the feast doing what God told him to do. And I had some people really upset with me. He died because you told him to go to the feast. I said, what if he had died at home alone? He has no family in Dubuque. We, we found him immediately. We would have found him a week later. It was really hot that fall. That wouldn't have been a pretty sight. And he died doing what God told him to do. I, I, that's the way I want to go. So, again, no excuses. Get to the feast. And a lot of money, effort, time, and energy goes into it. And God, if you can't show up, I'm sorry. I don't know how God can use you in the kingdom. You got to get there. That wasn't in my notes. <laughs> Satan is the leader of fallen angels. And you find that a number of in a number of places in the Bible. I'll just quote a few. I don't have time to go there. John 12. 31, Matthew 12, 26, Matthew 25, 41, and, and I'll end there. I got, I got more. Uh, we all know, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that Satan is the god of this age, this present evil world, this age. Paul clearly says that. We know in Luke 4, 6, the devil tried to tempt Christ, right? He tried in, in, in Luke 4, 6, he tried to tempt Christ. And what did he tell Jesus? He said, the devil said to him, all the authority, all this authority, he's looking at the earth, he's on a high pinnacle. He said, all this authority I will give you and their glory. And Satan says, for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whoever I wish. So God gave him that authority, gave him that position over the earth and the demons for 6,000 years, and it was his to give because Christ didn't say, you're a liar, that's not true, you don't have that authority. He didn't say that. He would have said that. He would have quoted scripture that said that. It was Satan's authority to give, but Christ didn't succumb to the temptation. He passed those tests with flying colors, and he qualified to replace Satan in that position over the earth, which he will rule over from Jerusalem in the millennium. Now, Revelation 12, 9 says that Satan is, you know, the devil, it deceives the whole world. There's some duality, as you'll see here in a minute. Now, let's, uh, first of all, I want to point out, God did not create a devil. And the title of the book is, Did God Create a Devil? The booklet. What God created was a perfect, beautiful archangel named Lucifer. How did he become Satan the devil? 
And Satan means adversary, right? Enemy of God. How'd that happen? Let's go to Isaiah 14. And this is a famous chapter here. It begins, by the way, Isaiah 14. And you might make a note here because people get very confused, and that's why we're here today. In Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. Isaiah 14, this famous chapter begins with, and this is prophecy, a time shortly ahead of us right now. When God will have sent, God the Father will have sent his son Jesus Christ to this earth, the second coming will have occurred, Christ will have intervened in world affairs, and the people of Israel, not just Judah by the way, people in the world think of the, Israel, the country over there in Europe as that's, that's Israel, no, they're the Jews, and they're one of 12 sons of Jacob, or Jacob's name was changed to Israel, so they're one of the Israelite nations, one of the 12 nations. They're not, people think that's it, that's everything. Uh, we used to explain the difference between Israelites and Jews is this, you know, all Californians are U.S. citizens, but not all U.S. citizens are Californians, all right? The Jews are one of 12 tribes. So when we look at this prophecy, this is not just Judah, it, it's the people of Israel, will have been taken captives as slaves, and that's going to happen here at the time of the end. This country's going into slavery, along with Britain, by the way, who seceded from Brexit, Brexit left the European Union. And by the way, Mr. Armstrong and others are saying that long time ago, Britain will leave. They're not going to be a part of it. They're Israelite. They're going to be attacked by the beast power. So anyway, uh, again, if you understand prophecy, you would know that. You don't, you don't have to be a whiz. You just have to know this is what God says. So uh, anyway, they will have been taken captive, the Israelite nations, and God is going to intervene and bring them back to their promised homeland. And we read about it here in Isaiah 14 um, in the beginning verses of this chapter. Uh, and so then we also know, now, as we read this, I want to point out that this is not speaking of the king of ancient Babylon who was Nebuchadnezzar. It's speaking of a modern successor of this ancient Babylon. It's speaking of the one who will be the ruler of the soon coming resurrected Holy Roman Empire. We call him the beast. So with that in mind, let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. And I'll just read, I'll start with verse 1. It says, For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will, now Jacob, his name was changed to Israel, right? Israel we could insert there. Mercy on Israel and will still choose Israel and settle them in their own land. The strangers will be joined with them and they will cling to the house of Jacob. Drop down to verse 3. It shall come to pass in the day the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow, right? The times, time of Jacob's trouble lies yet ahead. And from your fear and the hard bondage in which you were made to serve, that you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. So this is the time setting of these verses, and it's important to understand that. So this account shows us that this ancient king, this king of Babylon, sorry, not ancient king, this king of Babylon disrupted the earth, this man who is the leader of this end time beast power. He's an invader, he's a conqueror, he's a warmonger. He's going to take away from everyone else, acquire all that he can. It's the way Satan operates. Uh, this is the opposite philosophy of God. And so this guy is either possessed or certainly influenced at this point by Satan himself. And this, again, is the future, this king of Babylon, future civil ruler, and I'll say that again, civil ruler over the prophesied United States of Europe. And those prophecies in Revelation 17 and 18 take this to the next level, but uh, we don't have time for that today. So by the time of this prophecy, the king of Babylon will have been utterly defeated by the intervention of the living Jesus Christ when he comes in power and glory. We continue on in verses 7 and 8. It says, The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. Indeed, the cypress trees, cypress trees rejoice over you, and the cedars of Lebanon. 
saying, since you were cut down, no woodsman has come up against us. So this is a, a time of peace. This is what happens in the future. It's, it's a wonderful prophecy as you read it. Now, when we get to verse 12, we see that this human type, the king of Babylon, now is going to shift to an arch anti-type. And we know that by the context and by the words in the verses. And let's see what it says here in Isaiah 12, uh, sorry, 14, verse 12. It says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? So we know who it's talking about. How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nation? So again, Lucifer did that through this human military leader with his power spoken of in the first 11 verses. Uh, you know, and then that, that leader's overthrown. And by the way, Lucifer, the name means shining star of the dawn. Again, we use the word star, angel, shining star of the dawn, or bringer of light. That's the way God originally created him. Beautiful archangel. He says, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars or the angels of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. That's where God's heavenly throne is in the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So this former archangel who was placed over, as we'll see, a third of the angels that sinned, uh, you know, at one point had a throne in heaven. And he, at this point, wants to get back up to heaven and not got off the throne. And he wants to be the supreme ruler of the universe himself. He wants to take God's place. And verses 12 through 14, again, apply to a time prior to the creation of the first human, Adam. Now, when you get to Revelation 12, and I'm going to take time to do this, which means we're not going to finish the sermon, so I might as well just realize that. This is going to be a two-sermon. or two, ones, two sermon. Let's go to Revelation 12. Keep your mark here in Isaiah 14. Revelation 12, 7. Again, there's duality in this. All right, okay, Revelation 12, verse 7. It says, And war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought but they did not prevail nor was place found for them in heaven any longer so this is a prophecy of what's going to occur at the time of the end now we also know in verse 4 that satan's tail drew a third of the stars of heaven a third of the angels went into this rebellion along with him they were cast to the earth and, and christ talks about that in luke's gospel account he says i saw satan like lightning fall from heaven. Or maybe he used the word Lucifer, the one who became Satan. But he said, I, I saw that. Like, I was around. I existed. I, I, I saw that happen. But anyway, there is also a, a, a prophecy of the future because Satan is going to be trying to knock God off the throne again. It's not going to work. Just, here we go again, right? And it says, so the, the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of Christ have come. So you see the time setting. It's the end. Christ, the second coming of Christ. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Christ had died, right? He sacrificed for us. And by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. To the death. We have to, to get to that point. Every single person in God's church has to get to the point where you do not love your life to the death. God comes first. And if you have to sacrifice your life for whatever reason to not deny God, to do the right thing, you should be willing to do that. And if you're not, you're not where you need to be yet. You got some work to do. It says, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you and you who dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. 
So at the time of the end, has this already happened or is this about to happen? We know we see demon activity everywhere. We see Satan's very active. I don't know. I'm not the prophet, right? We'll see. God will make it plain. But we know this is happening at the time of the end. And we see how violent and angry and upset that he is and the demons are. Verse 13, now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. There are people who say, oh, this is about Mary and Christ. No, it's the woman here represents the church. And I, I know that, and you should know that, because the very next verse says, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent, three and a half years from the presence of the serpent. This is the place of safety, not a place of safety, but the place of safety. It's one place that the church or the woman's going to flee to where she is nourished for three and a half years and protected. If, if you think, you know, these people who are, it's about here, you know, that Christ was born, Joseph and Mary were warned, they fled to Egypt, see, that was the flight. Well, that wasn't three and a half years. Read what Josephus wrote. Read what uh, other historians wrote uh, about this, um, and, and you find out that, uh, like Eusebius would be another one, it was about three or four months that they were in Egypt before Herod died not three and a half years. And shortly thereafter, in Matthew 2, Christ told Joseph and Mary, go back. You know, the people who sought the life of your son are, are out of the picture. Get back, and they move back to Nazareth. So clearly it's not, uh, this is a, a woman, the church, and it's place of safety at the time of the end, and the context of everything written is that as well. And by the way, Herod died a absolutely brutal, miserable death um, it's like God took vengeance on him. Let me give you just a, a side point here. Uh, here's the account that Josephus and uh, Eusebius give us uh, about his death. It says, A burning fever seized him, an intolerable itching over his whole body, continual pains of colic. His feet swelled with droopsy. He had an inflammation in the lower part of his belly, a putrefaction of his private parts, which bred worms, a frequency and difficulty of breathing, convulsions in all his members he had a voracious appetite a stinking breath and his intestines abounded with ulcers he attempted to kill himself but was prevented that's how he died you got to be careful going against god and his 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 son jesus christ so we see that again this is about the church and and a flight now go back we, we took a side point there i'd done that a few times Let's go back to Isaiah for a minute. Again, Satan says, I'm going to ascend to the heights of the clouds. I'm going to be like the Most High. I'll become the Most High. I'm going to knock God off his throne. And then when you get to the 15th verse, verse 15, it returns to the human king. And you might make a note of that. And again, the context plainly shows it. Uh, you see it very clearly here. You shall be brought down to Sheol, or the grave. Spirit cannot die. Humans die. Now, let's go to Ezekiel 28, because we've got to tie that in. Ezekiel 28. And I'm not teaching anything new. This is what we've taught for a long time, and, and it, the Bible bears it out. Um, sometimes I'll say, well, this is what Mr. Armstrong and the church taught. Well, it's what the Bible teaches, and this is how they explained it. But we can explain it the same way. If you prove it, you study it, which you should. Don't take what I say and say, oh, that's it, he said so. No, prove it. Don't take what Mr. Armstrong said without proving it. He said so. Uh, we're not here to try to mislead anybody. We, we want, we're want we trying to lead you in the right path. Part of my job as a minister is to uh, make the meaning clear, right, to help give understanding to verses. Um, that's, And I've learned from other teachers, and, and I'm passing on what I've been taught kind of thing. But, but what we also have proven, uh, we have to be able to back it up in Scripture. So, by the way, if you get a little context here, Ezekiel 26, if you read through these chapters, speaks of the ancient uh, city of Tyre. It was a great commercial mecca. Uh, Tyre was, again, the commercial mecca of the ancient world. Babylon uh, was the political uh, capital. 
And this city, the city of Tyre, would be much like modern day, like New York or Paris or um, London or Tokyo. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 28, I'm going to start in verse 1. It says, the word, the, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am God, I sit in the seat of gods, in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not a god, though you set your heart as the heart of a god. So here we have this human prince of Tyre. Um, we see in the context as we read chapter 27, 28, he's wealthy, he's surrounded by beauty. Uh, he says, I am a god, but God says, no, you're a man, you're not a god. Uh, this is the one that we know at the time of the end is the great false prophet or the man of sin. Okay, that's who this is talking about. And let's go to 2 Thessalonians. They're one and the same. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4. And notice the parallel. It says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day will not come, the second coming of Christ, if, if you look at the context, will not come unless two things happen. Number one, unless the falling away comes first. Falling away is an apostasy. It's a defection from truth or faith. That has to happen, God says, right? And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Notice how he's explained or uh, uh, characterized. Who, exalts, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's how vain, pompous, and arrogant the false prophet will be at the time of the end. So again, Ezekiel 26 refers to the ancient Tyre as a forerunner or a type of the present yet future system, right? We know that the woman, the false prophet, rides the beast. So there's a correlation. That's why it's called the Holy Roman Empire resurrected. So you have the beast power, but you also have this, this false prophet. Uh, Isaiah um, 27 and 28 uh, refer, refer again not to the ancient uh, leader of the city of Tyre, as chapter 26 does, but to an important personage in Satan's hand, again, either possessed or certainly led by uh, Satan in our time in which we live here at the time of the end, just before the second coming of Christ to bring peace. And this prophecy points to this great personage who is ruling spiritually over nations. Um, and uh, also we'll see that it lifts to Satan himself again in, in verse 12. Verse 12, it says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now that doesn't describe a human being. We have shifted gears in verse 12 when we get to those words. Here's the other proof. Verse 13, you were in Eden, the garden of God. There's no human being at the time of the end that was in Eden, right? The garden of God. This again is a reference to Lucifer who became Satan. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. This again seals up some total of wisdom, perfection, and beauty, and that's the way Lucifer was created by God in the beginning. He says, you, verse 14, were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God, and you walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. He was the mountain, his government, or throne of God. God established him. This was an anointed cherub that covered. And when you go to Exodus 15, verses 17 through 20, you see a description of the throne of God in heaven from which he rules the universe. And there are two archangels, cherubim, super archangels, whose wings spread out over the throne, and he was one of those. Now, in Ezekiel 28, 14, the, this former Lucifer uh, is being pictured as being on earth. He had formerly been on the throne of God in heaven. 
Um, again, he's a spirit being, not human flesh. You were perfect in the ways from the day that you were created. So all of the angels, including Lucifer, were created by God. They didn't exist eternally. He says, he said, you were perfect in your ways, notice, till iniquity or lawlessness was found in you. So God didn't create a devil. He created a perfect, beautiful archangel with tremendous talent in music, right? And, 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 and put him in a, a key position. And Lucifer allowed that beauty and that perfection to fill him with vanity, and he became envious of God's power. He resented authority above him. He plotted with his angels, and then he drew a third of them in this rebellion to knock, him off, knock God off the throne and become God himself. The light bringer <laughs> became the prince of darkness. Lucifer, right, shining star of the dawn, became Satan, who means adversary. The penalty for them was not death, because, again, they're immortal spirit beings who cannot die, and that's been explained in many Many times, and, and I'll show you the verse in the Gospels here in a minute. He says in verse 16, By the abundance of your trading you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, right? the government, the throne of God. I destroyed you, O Lucifer, uh, over, uh, co covering cherub, or cherub from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. And from the middle of verse four, uh, 17 and on, the context then goes back to the human, religious, political leader of whom the prince of ancient Tyre was a forerunner. So it shifts at that point back to a human. Now, some people look at verse 16 here, and they go, look, uh, Satan was destroyed. That's what it says. And so he died. Uh, not the case, as we see in the world around us today. But... Um, it says, if you read this carefully, verse 16, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within. You sinned, therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you. And in some translations, it says from that position. In other words, God removed him from his presence, and he, he did not physically kill Satan. He did not destroy him. He didn't cease to exist, but he was destroyed from a certain place. And which, where was that? The mist of the stones of fire. God's throne, his seat of authority. And if you go to Revelation 21, 18 through 21, it gives a description of the stones of fire, the same ones we're talking about here, Revelation 21, 16 through 21, that uh, are going to be used in the holy city in the new, new uh, you know, New Jerusalem. So God's not speaking of his physical death or destruction. He is removed from God's presence. He's destroyed from it. He's taken away from it. He's cast down. All right, let's, um, let's move on to Psalm 104, verse 30. So the sin of the angels caused the destruction of the earth. Just as the violence and sin of mankind caused the flood, just as the, the sin and, and ways of life in Sodom and Gomorrah caused them to be destroyed uh, by fire and brimstone, uh, burnt to the ground, and all these examples are clearly laid out for us. But notice King David here is inspired in, in Psalm 104, verse 30 to say this. He says, you send forth your spirit they are created, you renew the face of the earth. So it, there was a renewing of the face of the earth. Darkness covered it, right? It would go back to the initial chapter, uh, Genesis 1. And God had to, you know, clear away the darkness to allow sun to penetrate the earth. He had to create the animals and all the things that are in it. And again, what God created was very good. The nature of the beast, who's corrupted the nature of the beast? Satan. The lions didn't eat Adam when he was naming them. A lion will eat you now. They'll attack humans for food. God said in the millennium, he's going to change the nature of the beast back to where he made them in the first place. But right now we live in a world that's violent, and Satan loves violence and murder, and he's a liar. The Bible calls him what he is. He's the adversary. 
Now, what's going to happen to the beast that we talked about in the false prophet? Revelation 19, verse 20. Revelation 19, verse 20. Here's the fate of the leader of the beast power. And the false prophet. It says, And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So these are Satan's two chief human instruments at the time of the end. The leader of the beast power, who makes war, right? This dude is bad. And... The great false prophet, the woman, right, the holy Catholic church, (laughs) is what they call it, rides the beast. So what is God going to do to them? What's Christ going to do? These two, he says at the end of verse 20, were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. So two people pictured. One is the civil ruler over the ten kings in their nations. The other is the great false prophet. And they're both human, and they're both destroyed by fire. That's what God says. Now, if we go back to Genesis, we see that Satan lied to Adam and Eve. He told Eve, you know, God said, don't eat of that fruit. You can eat of anything else, but this tree, don't eat of it. Satan goes, you will not surely die. And and then we see, you know, one of the big doctrines that Satan has pawned out on humanity is immortal soul doctrine, right? and, And when you die, you go to heaven. But if you're bad, you're going to be you know, tortured in hell for eternity. It's interesting. These are the kind of teachings that Satan pawned off on an unsuspecting mankind who bought it. They bought the lies. It's not in the Bible. It's also interesting how deceptive he can be because Revelation 12, 4 said, his tail drew a third of the stars. A third of the angels went into this rebellion. How long did that take? Who knows? Mr. Armstrong in the Mystery of the Ages said it could be millions or billions of years that that took for that to happen. The fallen angels, remember, are spirits. They're not human beings. And I mentioned Luke 10, 18. Christ said, I saw Satan like lightning fall from heaven. Now, the ultimate goal of Satan and the demons is to destroy us and really wipe out human beings. They like to eliminate human beings. And so what are the things here at the time of the end that are so prevalent, right? Homosexuality. There's no human race if, if everybody's homosexual. That, that can't work. God's about family. Satan's destroy family. Look at the sins that are pre- abortion. Let's kill as many babies as we can, right? Let's legalize it everywhere. Kansas, where I live, I thought middle of the country might be conservative, but we voted, let's kill babies. If you can't do it in Texas, come on up here. We'll do it for you. I mean, what is happening in our country? That, Satan's behind this. What did the baby do to die? I mean, if I went and killed your pet, these people, I'd be in prison. They go nuts. But let's kill babies just because we don't want them. They're inconvenient. I didn't want this kid. Maybe you should have thought of that before you did what you did to cause the kid to come into existence. And there are a lot of people who love to adopt little babies that can't have kids. Don't kill the baby. This is where we're at. Violence fills the earth. And in some, some respects, maybe worse than it was before the flood. So in order to accomplish this deception and, and Satan to get his plan to work, uh, he and the demons have been busy. Satan tried to destroy Adam and Eve, right? Then he came along when, when Christ was born. He, all the babies, ma- male children in that area that were you know two and under, kill them. We see that he tried to wipe the Jews out, right, back in the days of Esther, and God stopped it. Christ is a Jew, a lion of the tribe of Judah. He came from that tribe. He tried to wipe the tribe out. He tried to get Satan, Satan tried to, to get Christ to sin in that great temptation. It didn't work. He just keeps trying. And if he did that to Christ, and he's done it down through history, don't think that he's not doing it now. That's why you have to pray and study and stay close to God. You can't let it happen. The time is coming very shortly ahead of us in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1, 2, and 3 show us Satan's going to be bound when Christ returns. And I want to end with this here today because we're out of time. 
You know, God has this master plan of salvation. He's not willing that any should perish. He said, I want to see people make it. I desire all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, just not right now. Paul said, look, God has created, committed them to disobedience that he might have mercy on them. It's not time for everyone to be called now. This is not an easy time. It would be much easier for people in the millennium with Satan and the demons bound, society basically a godly society, because all the churches will be true churches. You won't have to worry about a small crowd or traveling a long distance. You just walk to church like we did in Ambassador College. Like you get out of your dorm, you put your suit on, you walk down to church. It's, so I want to go to the auditorium or do I want to go to the gymnasium at the college or over to Imperial Gym? Because we got church at all three today happening at the same time in the morning and the afternoon. It was wonderful. We don't have that anymore. We're scattered. We're like most church people have been for 2,000 years. And we think we're unique. Man, this is tough. There's not many of us. Suck it up. This ain't that bad yet. We can do this. We can keep going. I don't care if there's two people sitting here. Keep going. And we have to press to the kingdom. It's coming. We got to keep rolling. He says this, when Christ returns, chapter 20, verse 1, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into a bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. We read about that in verse 7, 8, 9, and 10. Same chapter. But they're gone. Out of, they, they can't influence people in the millennium. Wow, what a change is going to take place. But we see where where devil came from. He wasn't created. How did he become that? We've seen in Isaiah and Ezekiel how that happened. Now, next time we've got to pick this up and say, what is their fate? What's the ultimate fate? And I've hinted at it several times. And... We're going to look at Luke chapter 20 and other verses in the next sermon to, to talk about what's, what's going to happen. We'll also talk about the lake of fire that's burning throughout the millennium, the lake of fire that Peter talks about that, that it covers and engulfs the entire surface of the earth, and uh, a little bit about the new heavens and the new earth. So the, these are important prophecies of the future. We couldn't fit them in all today. I was aggressive. We got halfway through it. So we'll do it next time. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing all of you at the feast get signed up. Uh, we need you get, get, to get registered. Have a good day. For more information, go to our website at cogassembly.org. Copyright 2022, Church of God Assembly. All rights reserved.